Hey Health Junkies, it's time for The Health Fix. Join your host doctor, Janine Krause, as she gives you a dose of what you need to know and do right now to take control of your health from the inside out to rebel against aging, look damn good, fight stress, and laugh every day. Hey, Dr. Janine Krause here. Before we take a deep dive into neuroinflammation, its causes, and ways to treat it, there's a few things I want you to know. This podcast is to offer hope, ideas, and suggestions for you to take to your care providers. Severe anxiety, depression, PMDD all need medical supervision, especially if there's suicidal tendencies or psychosis as part of someone's condition. This podcast isn't meant to diagnose, treat, or replace the advice of a medical professional. With that said, let's get on with the podcast. Hello there, health junkies. Welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Kraus. Today's episode, we're going to be talking about how chronic infections cause neuroinflammation and ultimately trash your nervous system. Now, you might be thinking, what is neuroinflammation? Well, it's an inflammatory condition in which your nervous system becomes irritated. So if you have anxiety, depression, agitation, irritability, anger management issues, you might have neuroinflammation. Chronic headaches, migraines, nerve pain are also in this category. Now, there are some severe conditions that go along with neuroinflammation, such as now there are some severe conditions that go along with neuroinflammation, such as MS, alateral sclerosis. So these are severe cases. I'm not necessarily talking about severe cases today. However, they are considered neuroinflammation. What this podcast is all about is helping you identify if you're headed down that pathway to neural inflammation, and I'm here to help you to put the stops on it so that you don't end up with severe neuroinflammatory conditions such as chronic nerve pain, complex regional pain syndrome, all kinds of things in terms of the rare or the more common neurological conditions in which the medications are just not that pretty. So I'm here to save you from those issues. So of course, if you know anybody that is suffering with headaches, migraines, nerve pain, depression, anxiety, even chronic constipation fits in this category, share this podcast with them. All right, so I wanted to talk about this because I'm seeing a rise of neuroinflammation types of conditions in my office, and I'm starting to notice that there's some deep connections between chronic infections, leaky guts, and leaky blood-brain barriers. So your blood-brain barrier is what keeps things from getting to your brain. And you definitely don't want viruses in your brain. You don't want worms in your brain. We've all probably seen those gross pictures online of worst-case scenarios of parasite infections. But the point here is I want to shed light on how these things develop and signs you should be looking for and what to do about it. So... Let's talk a little bit more about neuroinflammation for a bit. Now, I mentioned it's irritation of the nervous tissue. And what exactly does that mean? It means that your blood-brain barrier is degrading. Much like leaky gut, molecules could be heavy metals, could be toxins, could be viruses, could be different things are getting across into your brain and causing it to become irritated. How does this manifest? Well, like I mentioned before, migraines, headaches, anxiety, depression. Sometimes it even manifests as an overactive nervous system, meaning you might have neuropathy, tingling. Um, You might have issues with panic attacks. You might feel lightheaded, dizzy. You might even have chronic fatigue. These are all signs that something's up with your nervous system. Now, a lot of times in the podcast, I talk about the fight or flight system being off and chronic stress will cause your body to go on hyper alert 
causing your immune system to become activated, and it's going to produce a bunch of chemical messengers that say there is something going on. And then all those chemical messengers over time end up causing damage to your nerves. And yes, your vagus nerve, your autonomic nervous system, which is all part of your fight or flight system, can become damaged over time. And stress causes increased production of something called tumor necrosis factor alpha, in addition to a cytokine called IL-1 and a host of other things that I won't give you all the boring details of that. Just to say that the longer we are stressed, the more our body sits in a state of being inflamed and irritated, and the more it has a chance to attack itself. Now, of course, you might be thinking to yourself, well, if the body's starting to attack itself, wouldn't I end up with autoimmune conditions? Absolutely. And autoimmune conditions are linked to neuroinflammation and vice versa. The more agitated your nerve becomes, the more you might have an autoimmune type of condition. Now, the opposite of that is the more infections that you have in your body, the more possibility you have for autoimmune conditions too. So... It behooves you to look at these things and see if you're having certain chronic symptoms. It's time to tackle them and figure out the source. Now, another big source of neuroinflammation can be traumatic brain injuries. Hands down, the, the symptoms that someone experiences after a brain injury or a concussion are classic neuroinflammation signs. Now, a lot of us might blow these things off and say, ah, oh, it's no big deal. You know, yeah, maybe I didn't lose loss of, I didn't have any loss of consciousness, but I didn't feel good for a couple of days after, you know, I had my concussion. Well, guess what? That's neuroinflammation. Now, take those symptoms and put them into a chronic state where you're having that headache, just that low-grade headache, not feeling so great day in, day out, or perhaps that headaches day in, day out, and it progresses to migraines, or perhaps you have just chronic anxiety that seems to just be worsening. These are all things to pay attention to, especially if you've had a brain injury. Now, folks of my age in the 40s or older, a lot of us have had multiple injuries and it wasn't even thought about that that could be an issue. I have a couple of patients in my practice who've had multiple traumatic brain injuries. And that's not good. Because those multiple brain injuries are insults to the nervous system over and over again, which are going to cause neuroinflammation on a chronic level. And there's going to be flight or flight issues. There's going to be neuroinflammation causing signaling issues from brain, so mission control, hypothalamus and pituitary, to the rest of the body. So now we're going to see hormonal imbalances, which is another thing to look at in terms of assessing your neuroinflammation. Now, of course, like I mentioned already once, and I'm going to highlight one more time, the goal of my podcast is to help folks catch these symptoms early and keep them from turning into a full-on debilitating neurological condition. Now, of course, if you are already at a pretty debilitated state, there are folks out there that can help you, and I don't want you to lose hope. I'm not a specialist in that department. And I'm hoping to interview Dr. Diana Driscoll here soon. I have her contact. We've been communicating. So hopefully I can get her on the podcast so that we can talk about her story and how she's helped a lot of people with chronic debilitating nervous system conditions. Now, if you're interested in her information, it's P-O-T-S-C-A-R-E dot com. Check her out. I'm hoping to have her on soon, just giving you a preview. Now, if you're listening to this podcast and you're going, I don't know if this fits me. I want to focus on brain you know, cognition and making myself smarter and staying smarter as I get older. Well, guess what? This could apply to you because how do we essentially lose our mental sharpness as we get older? Well, more trauma and more insults to our nervous system. So this information absolutely does apply. But if you're wanting to like jump right to focusing, my episodes 40, 41, and 72 all cover broken brain conditions. And I discuss how to work on that and focus. So go to that if you're looking to really work on your cognition. If you're not, stick with me here. So 
the more irritated the brain and the more irritated your nerves are, the more leaky you have of your blood-brain barrier. So I mentioned before, like you can have toxins, infections, all kinds of things can get in there. It's a good thing in a way when you're looking at being able to supplement someone and try to help them with calming the brain, but it's kind of a double-edged sword because at the same time, as fast as those supplements can get into the brain because of the leaky blood-brain barrier, those supplements will dump out fast. This is why for a lot of people who had, who have had multiple concussions or traumatic brain injuries, certain supplements might work for a minute and then they don't work anymore. Same thing goes for some of you out there who maybe you haven't had a brain injury, but you notice that supplements will work for a little bit and then they don't work over time, especially for anxiety, depression, a lot of the mood disorder stuff. And it has to do with the leaky blood brain barrier. So what causes a leaky blood brain barrier and a neuroinflammation condition exactly? Well, my thought is that it's a combination of factors. It's kind of like this perfect storm of contributing factors. Poor diet, stress, artificial sweeteners, those have absolutely been linked to inflaming the nervous system. So has MSG. A lot of us have heard of MSG and we'll look for ingredients, but guess what? It hides in ingredients. It's often hidden in, in words that look like monosodium glutamate, but they're like sodium glutamate or some version of that. So you got to read your labels. Now, excess sugar, processed grains, the lectins from the processed grains, molds, of course. I see a lot of folks, because of where I live, I think to an extent, because in the Tacoma, Washington area, it's a damp area. We have a lot of mold that lives in older homes. But molds can be a big issue causing neuroinflammation. So can environmental allergens, food allergens, home. So in terms of your home, if you have exposure to heavy metals in your water, what about your toxic cleaners that you use? Are you still using a dry cleaner that doesn't, isn't a green dry cleaner? Now, of course, that's a whole nother story in terms of are they truly green, but non-chemical dry cleaners. What about your cooking utensils? Are you still, you know, flipping your burgers on your fry pan there with a plastic spatula? That's chemicals going into your food. Do you have a scratch nonstick pan? Chemicals going into your food. Now, what about microbes and hormone imbalances? Those are also kind of another contributor to having neuroinflammation. It's pretty popular right now to think about your gut microbiome, but how many of you have actually tested it? to know exactly what bugs you have. Do you have viruses? Do you have parasites? Do you have yeast? Do you have mold toxins in your gut and in your body? If you have no idea and you have any of the symptoms I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, you want to be thinking about checking this stuff out. Functional medicine docs, naturopaths, all over it. Things you want to look at. Hormone imbalances, too, because if you have a hormone imbalance and you've had a traumatic brain injury, you've got some neuroinflammation affecting mission control in your brain. And I would venture to say that most folks who have leaky blood-brain barriers are going to have hormonal imbalances anyway. But it could be important, one, to balance your hormones, but two, to figure it out as to how it's connected for you. Because ultimately, keep in mind that every single one of my podcasts, I'm here to give you information to help you figure out your issues, for you to self-advocate for yourself, for you to ask your doctors or find doctors that will help you to get to the bottom of your symptoms versus covering them up. Now, here's a crazy thing. Now, if you're still wondering if neuroinflammation really is connected to viruses and if I might be the craziest person in the universe, one, you can go on PubMed and find connections. Epstein-Barr virus, the monovirus, is connected with nervous system inflammation. But if we go way back to after World War I, scientists figured out that a influenza pandemic, so a flu virus, triggered folks to get Parkinson's. Now, Parkinson's is a neurological condition where we have 
foundation, so breaking down of the substantia nigra, which is part of the, the center core of the brain. And this is a big deal. This is a really big deal. We knew back World War One. it's the early 1900s here we're talking about, we've known that viruses have been connected to neuroinflammation. But why are we not freaking talking about that with people and telling people to look for viruses as a trigger? Now, Dr. Diana Driscoll, who I'm hoping to, to interview here soon, talks about how she caught a virus in Costa Rica that caused her to have a neuroinflammatory condition. And I see a lot of patients who have mono as a teen, and they just don't seem to recover. They always seem to have headaches and migraines since that time frame. What is that? Neuroinflammation. Now, there's another component that I see is where folks will have mono as a teen, but then they'll get the mono reactivated. And there's a lot of conventional doctors out there that do not believe that mono can be reactivated. I am here to tell you that it's true. I see it with labs and I see it with symptoms. It's possible. Why? Because the more stressed out someone becomes, the more that their immune system allows for viruses, bacteria, microbes, etc. to come in and invade. And the longer they're there, in terms of viruses in particular, viruses affect our nerves. Viruses live in our nerves. Herpes viruses. Mono is a herpes virus, but herpes virus 1 or 2, so above the belt 1, below the belt 2, those guys will infect the nerves. I see a lot of people with chronic back pain related to a herpes simplex virus 2 infection. So if you have chronic back pain, get your herpes titers checked. See if you have it. It could be waxing and waning of the herpes virus. Now, what is going on where this herpes virus can actually cause destruction of the nerve? Well, it's your body trying to keep that virus in check in a natural process, but it just can't do it. It can't seem to fight the infection. Why? A couple different things. You have maybe multiple infections. Maybe you have more things going on. Maybe you have stress. Your body's throwing up cytokines, and, and cytokines are messages from your body cells, in particular white blood cells, that are saying, we have an infection, we have an irritation, we have something we need to clean up. And we want the T cells, which are a type of white blood cells, to regulate this crazy inflammation and say, okay, we've created you know, the inflammatory reaction, we've taken care of the issue, we're done. But unfortunately, in the case of overactive immune systems, we lose that ability to regulate white blood cell reaction and cytokines, so chemical messenger signaling, and it overdoes it, and it keeps overdoing it, and we get autoimmune conditions in the areas where we had original injuries or infections or wherever effect, infection decided to lodge itself. So like I was mentioning before, there's a lot of folks who have chronic low back pain or chronic sciatica that was provoked by a herpes simplex 2 virus. Chronic neck pain might have been provoked by mono, Epstein-Barr virus. Now, before you think I'm absolutely crazy, don't worry. There's lots of data, and I have some links in my podcast notes at drjkrausnd.com for you to check out if you want to get geeky with me and see the background here. Now, in terms of the actual immune cells of your nervous system, what are those guys called? Those are called microglia. And these immune cells of the central nervous system actually have been found to be more active during the day and less active at night. So they respond to circadian rhythms. What else responds to circadian rhythms? We do. Now, how do we do that? Cortisol. Now, imagine that these microglia who are more active during the day because when cortisol is a little bit more elevated versus at night when it's suppressed... What if your cortisol levels are up and down all day long and, and are going up at night too? These microglia get more active. So the more action in the microglia, glia, the more damage you have going on 
in your nervous system. So how do we work on that? Well, number one, if you are stressed out, you are damaging your brain. You will give yourself brain damage, literally. You'll give yourself nervous system damage. You got to work on that. You got to get that in check. And it's definitely a contributing factor, if not kind of the root of all evil, if you will. Now, if I look at why do people get sick in the first place? Why do we have illness in the first place? It's due to stressors. Why do we, we become depressed or anxious? Usually some type of situation provoked it. Maybe a change in lifestyle. Maybe you're not happy with your job. Whatever it may be, there's something that's going to provoke it. And the more that you harbor resentment and just become frustrated, or maybe it's the other thing. You love your, your gig, but you are overworking, working too hard. It's a whole nother you know, twist to it, but the more stressors on the body, the more it's opening up the body for infections, the more you're opening up your body for nervous system attacks. So stress is always going to be, if I have to look at like chicken or egg, I'm always going to be like, it might be, you know, one of the, the chicken or well, whoever you put first, the chicken or the egg, I don't know, but it might be one of the things that you would think about first. Let's put it that way. Bad example. <laughs> now, what else do you want to look at in terms of what really irritates the nervous system? Now, remember, I've mentioned Epstein-Barr virus, monovirus. You can look in your blood to see if you have a reactivated infection. It's a chronic mono panel. You can get that from LabCorp. I know Quest has it too. These are lab companies that are all around the U.S. I'm sure internationally you can find ways to look at it too. Cytomegalovirus. This is another virus that has a lot of effect on the nervous system. I will often see with cytomegalovirus folks having sciatica or pain that's a chronic nerve type of pain issue. Herpes viruses 1, 2, and 6 are highly related to nervous system issues. So are strep infections. So I highly recommend folks to look for ASO strep antibodies in their blood see if those guys are out of control. And so what I'm talking about is antibodies for all of these types of infections. Chlamydia and mycoplasma pneumonia are also another biggie that go after the nervous system. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, I, you know, I have cold sores, so obviously I have herpes virus 1. Okay, well... These viruses linger. As you know, you get cold sores probably whenever you're stressed or maybe around holidays like Valentine's Day and Halloween when there's more chocolate and nuts out there. Now, in your mind, you might be thinking, well, how can this virus that just kind of hangs out cause so much trouble? Well, you have the virus coming out a couple times a year or sometimes pretty cyclically folks will, just depending on who you are and what you're what your body constitution is like, what do you think that virus is doing when it's not causing an immune system reaction? It's sitting there trying to get your body to react. The cold sore is the ultimate reaction. So you have a chronic low-level viral infection. Now, if you want to get really detailed in this, it's something that you might want to think about in terms of going back through your history and seeing if you've ever had any chronic viral infection. And then connecting it to, oh, that's when my headache started, or oh, that's when I started to have X, Y, or Z type of pain. You know, with viruses, you might get that typical kind of ick, fevery feeling. Maybe you get like you know, kind of like when you get a cold, you got the headache, you just feel like heavy headed and off. We'll take those acute initial symptoms and put them down to a low grade. Do you feel like that? If you do, you might have a viral infection that's hanging on. Every single person that comes into my office, we're looking at chronic pain. I'm trying to figure out if they've ever had a chronic viral infection or if they've had an acute viral infection that turned chronic. Let's put it this way. A lot of people have herpes simplex 2 and don't know it. A lot of times when we get the first 
outbreak of a herpes virus, and in particular, too, a lot of times it's like a high fever. You feel like you're just super down and out sick. And then you might get the lesions that come out, or you might not. And this is super common for a lot of folks. And then after that, those symptoms will linger maybe for like a month or so. Mono does the same. And then the symptoms should go away. But if you chronically have a little bit of irritation, you might have neuroinflammation. So for example, one of the big things I see in my office is a lot of ladies will have something called vulvodynia, which is pain in the vaginal area. It causes really painful sex. It doesn't feel good. Sometimes, now I'm not saying every time, but sometimes this condition can be provoked by having herpes simplex 2. Why? Because it's the same innervated area, so the same nerves go to the vaginal area and the same nerves go to those muscles to tighten up that area. So that individual might have contracted herpes, had like their initial initial outbreak, or maybe not even noticed an initial outbreak. Maybe they had a fever, felt sick for a little bit, and then life went on. And then all of a sudden, in that same corresponding year or a couple months within having the initial kind of ick feeling, they started with vulvodynia. Something to think about. Now, I'm not saying every single case. Keep that in mind. But this is kind of things to get you thinking about how does this play out. Think of the cause of neural inflammation really as a bug you just never fully kicked. Now, gut bugs and biofilms. Sounds like fun, huh? Now, gut bugs can also be a reason for why you have neuroinflammation. You have a ton of nerves surrounding your gut. In particular, you have the nervous system called the enteric nervous system, which is connected to your autonomic nervous system, which is connected to your vagus nerve which your vagus nerve is your biggest fight or flight nerve in the system. And so if you have IBS, so irritable bowel syndrome, or a nervous gut, these kind of things might be related to gut infections, but also they are signs of neuroinflammation. Nerves of the gut are inflamed. Now, what's a biofilm? Some people will ask me, they, they get the idea that bugs live in their, their gut, you know, bacteria, viruses can live in your gut, as can yeast. Now, parasites too. Now, some folks might be thinking like, what is a biofilm? A biofilm is a large coating of bacteria, bugs, etc. Think about your shower curtain and when it gets moldy. That's a biofilm. Think about your sink by the drain around it. When there's like that pink or like yellowy or even brown black color, that's a biofilm. So you got that in your gut. Sounds kind of gross, but it's reality. Now, what do these bugs release that cause inflammation to your nerves? Something called lipopolysaccharides. These are toxins, otherwise known as endotoxins, that are produced in your gut. So now that I've ruined it for you for your gut, that does happen in your gut. That's why a lot of people will have some serious irritation in the gut when there is an infection. And especially when, you know, maybe they've had advanced testing, nobody can find anything, but they still have the inflammation. Chances are it's a gut bug issue. Now, there are a lot of ways you can test gut bugs. There's Viome out there. There's GI Mapping, which is Diagnostic Solutions Lab. There is Doctor's Data Lab, which is another lab I use. GI Mapping seems to be the most comprehensive way to look for viruses, parasites, bacteria, and mold in your gut. Now, a little side note here. If you are noticing that your gut's off, but you're also having signs of eczema, psoriasis, allergic reactions, hives on your skin, this is kind of, let's put it this way, your gut lining is leaky, but now it's starting to transfer to your skin. So it's a compounded situation. So if skin and gut issues, we really got to work on your gut lining and your brain lining. Now, another biggie is looking at hormones in that case too, because hormones are also strongly related to issues going on on the gut lining. Now, when you've looked at 
your gut bugs, you've looked at, say, your serum to see if you have any viruses left. What do you do after that? Well, I highly recommend that folks take a look to see heavy metals, things like arsenic, lead, mercury, cadmium. You can get that all tested through your blood. LabCorp, Quest, those labs do it. There are some specialty labs like ZRT labs that would do an even ex- more expanded heavy metals profile. And you can check them out at zrtlabs.com. They have a urine and a blood spot test. It's interesting, you know, especially if you think that you've been exposed to more heavy metals than just the standard lead, mercury, um, cadmium, and arsenic. Now, food stuff. Food sensitivities are a big deal. And I think for a lot of people, it's important to know if you have food or even environmental sensitivities. In the perfect world, you would have, say, a journal that could, you know, you could determine what is going to be your allergies based on how you react with food. But if you're trying to figure out a nerve issue and and time is of the essence, then I recommend doing a food sensitivity test and looking at environmental allergy testing. There's a company called Alivate. I use them to create a dental toothpaste to help with environmental allergies, but they do do some food and environmental testing. In in lieu of doing the scrape and poke testing that most allergy offices do, I do like this test. It's a blood test. It's not a bunch of skin pokes or prick test. And I find it very comprehensive in that it's looking at a lot of different types of animal dander in addition to a lot of different types of weeds and grasses and trees, et cetera. So I think it's important to find out all your sources of inflammation that could be attacking your nerves. Now, a lot of people will ask me, is there a direct test to tell me if I have a leaky blood-brain barrier or a leaky gut? And... Yes, there is. It's something called zonulin. It is a protein that's produced when there's leakiness going on to the blood-brain barrier or or the gut lining. So it's just a protein produced when there's damage to the area. Now, you can see that with GI mapping or doctor's data uh, stool testing. But do I always run that? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. I can pretty much tell you of a leaky blood-brain barrier if you've got chronic headaches, migraines, anxiety, depression, those kind of things, irritability especially. Now, if you're wondering if you have molds causing issues, there's something called the mycotox by Great Plains Labs, but there's also blood testing to look to see if you have mounted any antibodies. So IgE or IgG, these are looking at an antibody response to certain molds. Not too long ago, I just did a mold test on a gal who was having trouble smelling. And I was shocked at how high molds were on her labs. So molds are a big deal. Don't ignore them. If you think you've been exposed to mold, you live in a moldy, like, say, basement apartment, these are things you need to check out, especially if your home smells like mold. Why? Because mold messes with your vitamin B12 processing. And B12 is used in a lot of different mechanisms in the body, but in particular to help you to produce GABA to calm your nervous system down. And a lot of times if you don't have enough B12, you can have some pretty strong what we call neuropsych, so nerve the system, but psychiatric related symptoms. And so something to think about. Add to that having something called MTHFR, which is a genetic mutation that messes with your processing of B12 and folate, you've got double trouble. So yes, genetics would be another thing to consider. Is it my number one go-to for neuroinflammation? If I can't figure out what's going on with the basics, yes. And I'm kind of giving you the basic rundown of where I would head to look at testing. Now, another big thing with neuroinflammation is looking at an oat test. And this tells you how you're doing in terms of metabolism. Organic acid testing is awesome for telling you if you have deficiencies in certain amino acids, which could be part of a neuroinflammatory picture. I've already mentioned getting your hormones tested. I also highly recommend neurotransmitter testing, especially if you've got the anxiety, depression, irritability, just fight or flight feels like it's stuck wide open, I would test that. Now, yes, I've just 
rattled off at least 10 different tests. And you might be thinking, holy crap, Dr. Krauss, this is like thousands of dollars of lab testing. Yes, I understand. And normally I would do it sequentially based on how, you know, what direction I think is going to be the most legitimate in terms of what's going on and target it that way. I'm just giving you the broad base of all the different types of testing so that you have somewhere to kind of start going down that pathway to help figure out why you have neural inflammation. Now, number one for treatment, what the heck do you do to try to calm the nervous system down? Well, usually in my practice, I'm trying to get hormones balanced first. Why? Because females who have neuroinflammation usually have excess estrogen and low progesterone. Progesterone is what's known as a neurosteroid. Now, before you freak out and think, oh, my God, she's using the word steroid, it's a natural steroid that we produce already. We just aren't producing as much. Why? Because if you're stressed out, your body steals cortisol. So it takes it, – it does not steal cortisol. It steals progesterone to make cortisol. And guess what? You're going to have a deficiency of progesterone if you're stressed out. I see this over and over and over and over again. So if you're extremely anxious, you're agitated, you're just feeling on edge, neurosteroids are where I'm going to start with inflammation. And most of the time after traumatic brain injuries, I have a lot of folks who are just agitated as all get out. And I'm not talking just females. I'm also talking about guys. Guys can use progesterone as long as testosterone levels are within normal limits. And I will use testosterone, progesterone, and pregnenolone, which is a precursor to progesterone in some cases if I find the pregnenolone is also deficient. But those of you ladies who are out there listening to this and you have anxiety, depression, you know, even PMDD, which is premenstrual dysphoric disorder, this is a condition that basically, for lack of a better term, you feel batshit crazy before your period. And then once you get your period, you feel amazing. You need progesterone. And you might even need it at 400 milligrams or so in a micronized form, micronized based in oil. This is a hands down, you can get this at a pharmacy. This is what can be extremely helpful. So all psych doctors should be familiar with neurosteroids. They've been popular since the late 60s, early 70s. It's not something that's a new concept. However, I say they've been popular. They were popular then. Now we have all the psych drugs like our Zoloft and Paxils and Prozacs and blah, 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 which for some people work great and that's awesome. And for other people, they don't do crap. And I'm talking to you people who are not responding to chemical medications or don't want to be on the chemical medications. Now, my next podcast after this one, I'm going to talk all about neurosteroids in particular and how they are extremely useful in males and females. I'm not going to go into it today because neuroinflammation is more than just needing a hormone balance. Now, if you've had a traumatic brain injury... There's an amazing product that I was turned on to by one of my mentors from Bastyr, Dr. Paul Anderson. He mentions a product called Cover 3, and I've tried it out in some of my post-TBI patients, and it's freaking amazing. Now, it doesn't have anything that's like earth-shattering in it. It has curcumin, so an extract of turmeric, transroveratrol, which we know resveratrol from wine, and omega-3s, something called uridine, which comes from the cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower family. Alpha-GPC, which is alpha-glycerophosphocholine. That's a mouthful. And vitamin C. So it has certain components that are antioxidants, but also things that are neuroprotective to the brain. So cover three, if you know anybody who has had a brain injury, get them to check out cover3.com. It's a great product. You can take it in acute situations. You can take it in chronic situations. I highly recommend, though, in acute situations, getting on the neuro. Um, sorry, the cover three. Huge, huge, huge. So I 
can't stress that enough. For those of you who have not had a TBI or haven't had one in years but are still having neuroinflammation symptoms, Cover 3 is useful in lower dosages, meaning once a week taking it versus every single day or taking it, you know, because in acute situations, sometimes I have people taking the Cover 3 up to three times a day, whereas we might drop it down to once a day, once a couple times a week to help with calming the nerve inflammation. So Cover3.com, check that out. I have no financial gain from this, just that I do find it works because I've used the individual products like the turmeric, the omega-3s, and somehow whatever is in this combo. I agree with Dr. Anderson, who is an amazing naturopath. He just knows. And I don't know. It, I agree with him. He, he just knows how, that they work too, well together. And it's actually a naturopathic doctor who created the formula. So that's even cooler. So there you go. Props to Cover 3, folks, because I do think it is a great product. And I kind of think that anyone who's coaching football should have it on hand for just in case. And I feel like football teams should have it too. So there you go. If anyone's listening to this and have a relationship with a football team, Cover 3. Stat. All right. So now, after we started to work on stopping the inflammation, we got to work on fixing that blood-brain barrier. Resveratrol, like I mentioned, curcumin can help. Now, if you're like, I don't want to get cover three, not interested in it, fine. Um, I typically will have people use a combination of curcum avail, which is an oil-based liposomal, so enhanced delivery, turmeric, and taking two a day of those from a company called Designs for Health. You probably heard me mention them before. I also think the CBD is hugely important. Dosing is a little tricky. I have a podcast dedicated to how to dose CBD. You can check that out in my notes in drjkrausnd.com. You can click on that and you can see that episode. Now, Boswellia Plus by Yush Herbals. This is another one that my mentor, Dr. Paul Anderson, mentions, and I highly agree that it is a good formula. So Boswellia Plus and Curcuma Veil together, two capsules a day, um, to start and then going up to four a day, so two twice a day, is what you want to work on to get that blood-brain barrier fixed up. Same with your leaky gut. How do you do that? BPC-157. I've mentioned Body Protective Complex multiple times on my podcast, and I think that these peptides are great to help to fix the blood-brain barrier and to fix the gut lining. Now, if you determine that you have some gut bugs going on, you definitely want to go after that. One of the best gut bug killers out there is artemisin. I use Quicksilver brand. It is a very bitter, gooey extract, but it works out well. 80 milligrams a day is what I ramp people up to, starting with maybe 20, which is a half a dosage, and then up to 40, which is a regular dosage, and 80, which is the max dosage. I also really love Accelerated Silver and Accelerated Iodine. These are both products by Sarah Banta and her Accelerated Health Products company. Now, I talk all about her products in a podcast where I interview her. That's episode 139. So if you're looking at this and you're going, I want to learn more about that accelerated health products, Quicksilver, um, not Quicksilver, Silver, her accelerated silver and accelerated iodine and artemisinin, which is a good broad spectrum bug killer that is by Quicksilver brand. Now that's Amazon. You can find that easily. Now, you want to clear up heavy metals if you find that you have any of those in the system. That's a whole protocol that you could work with a naturopathic doctor or functional medicine doctor on. The other big thing is working on your diet. I can't stress enough and probably say it every single one of my podcasts. Eat closest to nature. Read your labels and get rid of anything that you can't pronounce in your food ingredients list. If you don't know what it try and even say in there chemicals, just get rid of it. Anything that looks like monosodium glutamate, get rid of it. Other biggie is clean up your hygiene in terms of what's going on in terms of your house and your kitchen because the more chemicals you have in your household products and your cleansers and your shampoos and all of that, the more you're going to have issues. So get rid of that junk. And I have a podcast even dedicated to that, too, for the kitchen. So I'll put that in my notes at drjkrausnd.com. 
The other biggie is enhancing your cell's ability to detox, meaning boosting your body's ability to clear out toxins once you've started to mobilize things from your body. N-acetylcysteine is quite possibly my favorite. Vitamin C and tocotrienols, annatto, vi- annatto E, which is a vitamin E product by Designs for Health. I love those. N-acetylcysteine, I like pure encapsulations. Vitamin C, I like an integrative therapeutics product. These are all linked in my podcast notes at drjkrausnd.com. But what they're doing is helping you to clear byproducts of cellular metabolism. You need to have your cells cleaned out to be able to reduce nervous system inflammation. Because keep in mind, your nerves are cells. I think we kind of forget that a little bit. Now, say you're experiencing extreme irritation, anxiety, agitation, anger. You might have too much glutamate hanging out in your brain. Now, you can test this via neurotransmitter testing Or if you have those symptoms and they're pretty severe, if you're in my office, I'd probably just give you these items. Now, N-acetylcysteine is a type of amino acid. At 500 milligrams twice a day, I typically will use that to clear excess glutamate out of the brain. Make sure, though, you're reading labels and not eating things that have MSG or derivatives in it. Very, very important. Now, fun fact about N-acetylcysteine, if you have anybody in your family that has a gambling addiction, this dosage will also help with that because it is a regulator of neurotransmitters. Now, say someone you know is getting to the point of like the anxiety just gets you almost to psychosis. And I'm talking about in terms of ladies who have PMDD, I'm talking about in terms of anxiety that just won't quit. Lithium orotate or carbonate can be helpful in this case absolutely huge and can progesterone. Sometimes I'll even go up to 600 milligrams of progesterone. Studies show that it can, in in certain time frames and in a controlled monitored state, you can use that much progesterone. But lithium carbonate up to one gram a day and lithium orotate, some of the small dosages, five milligrams can be absolutely useful. Now, I don't recommend in terms of if someone's going into extreme psychosis with anxiety, irritability, anger, I highly recommend getting a, a psych doc on board, but also a naturopathic doctor or functional medicine doc who is extremely experienced in working with psychosis. I don't want anyone to be alone in this department. You need support. You need more than just what I'm noting here. You need someone to talk to. But if someone is finding that they're getting really agitated, lithium orotate at 5 milligrams can be really useful. Vital Nutrients is a good brand. Now, calming the glutamate receptors. Like I said, you got to clear the glutamate out of the brain, but you also have to help those receptors to chill. My favorite product in this department is L-theanine. In my office, I will tell patients it's my break in case of emergency. If shit gets real, I need my L-theanine. L-theanine comes in 100 and 200 milligram capsules. I highly recommend getting the 200 milligram capsules. You can go up to 1,000 milligrams a day. Some folks say you can go up to 1,500. I would stick with 1,000 unless you have someone else helping you to keep things in check. Magnesium glycinate can help with glutamate receptors. Or you can even do a magnesium combo like buffered magnesium from Designs for Health. 5-HTP can help you to calm the glutamate receptors. I start at 50 milligrams and don't go up beyond 300 milligrams. And then I also, if we have a lady who has excess estrogen, DIM Pro by Pure Encapsulations can be magical to help to calm glutamate receptors because excess estrogen in your system can be a psychosis producer guys are probably like, duh. (laughs) But yes, estrogen, it has many benefits, but we definitely don't want the psychosis, do we, ladies? No. Okay. Histamines, another biggie that can build up in the brain, high, high likelihood of causing migraines and chronic headaches. If you suffer with headaches and those headaches are connected to overconsumption of red wine or garlic or sulfur products, you do not want to be taking N-acetylcysteine. Now, I mentioned N-acetylcysteine earlier, 
but if you have headaches, not a good thing for you, so note that. Instead, you want to try 500 micrograms of molybdenum for a month and see if you can reduce those headaches in response to sulfur items. You can also drop that dosage down from there, but do not muscle spasticity that goes along with nervous system conditions. One of the biggest helpers in terms of muscle spasms is glycine. I like vital nutrients powder, and I typically will dose between three and six grams each night. And I do that until the muscle spasms go away, and then you can drop down between one and three grams on the average. But muscle spasticity is common for a lot of people where muscles might be cramping, they might be jumping a little bit. A lot of times it happens at night, but it could be happening all day long. This is a sign of neuroinflammation as well that I didn't mention earlier, but find it absolutely important to tell you now. Now, another big common sign of neuroinflammation is insomnia. And for some people, they've tried every darn thing under the sun to help them sleep. And herbally or naturopathically, sometimes glycine can help with sleep too in this case. But if you've tried other herbal remedies and they're not working for you, amitriptyline is a prescription medication that could be helpful. So ask your doctor about that if you're really struggling with sleep and use it until you can get your blood-brain barrier to not be so leaky and your gut to not be so leaky and calm things down. You just might need it to get through all of the symptoms. Take N-acetylcysteine if you have headaches with red wine, garlic, sulfur items. Now, another big issue is, all right, I've covered a lot of information on this podcast. And don't worry, it's going to be in my podcast notes at drjkrausnd.com. But now it's time to take some action from this podcast. One step that I want you to do after this podcast is to look back at your neuroinflammation symptoms and write down what was happening in your life when these symptoms started. Were you coming off of a virus? Did you have a gut bug? Were you having gut symptoms? If you can remember anything around that time frame, look to see for the biggies, infections, viruses, bugs in the gut, anything related to stress. That'll help you to determine, okay, what's my next step to figure out the source of this issue? Next, then you'll go into What are you going to test to figure out if certain things are the culprit, if you have an infection, if you have something of that nature? So go do some homework in terms of what the heck is going on. And then the number two thing to do after this podcast is go and look at what's in the foods you eat. Get rid of anything chemical or anything you can't pronounce especially monosodium glutamate or something that sounds like sodium glutamate. Number one big thing in terms of nervous system irritant in foods. Now, if there's anyone out there that you know can benefit from this podcast, share it with them. My goal is to help you and others take control of your health and help you to be your own health advocate. If you have a question you can submit it on my website by clicking on podcast and then scrolling down to the bottom. I've got a whole form for you to submit your question. I love questions. I love to help. Please, if you or anyone you know has a question, send it over to me. Otherwise, all of my information is going to be in my resource section, in my podcast notes at drjkrausnd.com. You've survived another episode of The Health Fix You have a great day, whatever you're doing. Hey everybody, Dr. Janine Krause here. If you liked what you heard today, then head over to drjkrausnd.com to find my free resources and information to know when I post something new that's juicy that you might want to check out. Plus, head over to where you get your podcasts and like, subscribe, and write a review to help get the word out about me and help others at the same time to find me. It really does help and I really appreciate all of your reviews.